two out the first. It is March the 13th, 2023. I'm Ryan Balaji. It's great to have you here with us. We are presented by our friends at French Lake Resort in French Lake, Indiana. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed the players. Uh, the, the ending was about as good as you were going to ask for for a runaway victory. And we'll talk about that today. And then we're also going to talk about some equipment news, which we don't do a whole lot of on this show, but I think this is going to be found stuff that's really important that's going to start to take shape tomorrow. We'll talk about that in the second half of the show. But let's talk players. The new world number one, the once and future king, I suppose, or once and past king, depending on which uh, part of the English language you want to use correctly. But Scotty Scheffler is your player's champion. He has well won six times in his last 27 starts on the PGA Tour. And if you look at the list of tournaments he has won, there aren't duds. There are no duds on the list, in my opinion. For him to have won the players, the Masters, the best Phoenix Open field there's ever been, API, the WGC, I mean, what more do you want from this guy? He's been incredible, and uh, he, he did it again on Sunday, and he made it look really easy, which there aren't that many golfers in the history of the, the PGA Tour, or the LPGA Tour for that matter, I mean, put it in the tour, that make winning look as easy as Scotty Scheffler did on Sunday, and he got off to a nervous start, did not play his best golf out the gate, and it seemed like maybe there was a susceptibility there, Minwoo Lee came out pretty game, seemed like maybe he was going to be willing to challenge and look for a third win as a professional, his biggest, and first on the PGA Tour, and then comes the fourth hole, and Minwoo Lee hits a bad tee shot, is a dangerous hole, the fourth hole in my opinion is one of the best holes at TPC Sawgrass on the stadium course, it might be in the top three, if not the top two best holes on the golf course, and he found himself in trouble off the tee. He think he made what I thought was the right decision to lay up to try to stay short of the creek, get to a good number, hit a wedge, use the slope, try to make par, limit the damage, make no worse than bogey, maybe fit in a par. And he hits probably one of the worst 88-yard wedge shots you're ever going to see from a player of that caliber, puts in the water, makes a mess of the hole, all of a sudden Scotty Scheffler's in control. You had some players trying to make moves at Scheffler from way ahead. You had Hideki Matsuyama make a run. You had Tommy Fleetwood make a run. You had Max Homa make a run. You had Tyrrell Hatton, who shot a record-setting 29 on the final nine of the tournament. And that landed him in solo second at the end of the day because everyone else faded away. You got Taylor Montgomery who got in there. A bunch of them found the water on 17 or made a mess of 17. Hideki made a double along the way. And the golf course just bit these guys as it is wont to do, and that really opened the door for Scheffler after he made his move, where he made five consecutive birdies in the middle of the round, and at that point he knew he had the tournament won, and all he had to do was just get into the house, hit the critical shots, not find the water, not make any horrible mistakes, make no worse than bogey on any hole, and you probably had it done. And really the only mistake he made was on the tee shot on 14, blasted it right, fortunate to not wind up in a bush and need an unplayable, Instead, winds up on a weird upslope, one of those strange grass bunkers on that hole. Does the right thing, gets out, gets to the fairway, takes his medicine, makes his bogey, and then just played pretty much perfect golf there to the house. Got the 17, hit a good quality shot, hit, as, as he said, exactly where he wanted after the fact, and all of a sudden, he was there with a birdie putt from 8, 9, 10 feet away. The, the tournament was decided at that point, gets to 18, Knows he just needs to avoid the water to win and probably could just putt his way home. Blasts it way right. Not so far right that he couldn't hit it. And still gets gets the par anyway. Wins on 17 under 271. Wins 5 over Tyrrell Hatton. Wins $4.5 million. He extends his massive exemption that already has as the Masters champion. Gets technically one extra here because of that. Although it's kind of funny. Given that he's got the Masters exemption five years for winning a major. You get five year exemption for winning the players as well. Also get you a three-year exemption into all of the major championships. Obviously, Scotty Scheffler doesn't need that as the reigning Masters champion. He's in the Masters for life. And he's also in the other major championships for the next five years, including this one. So there's a, a lot to work with there for Scheffler. And, and good for him. I mean, he, he, he is playing a brand of golf right now that is really hard to beat. It is extremely steady. He does everything well. Nothing... I don't think perfectly, but the thing that he does extremely well is two things, in my, in my view. He, he takes golf and distills it down to what it really is, and that is doing what you can do to control 
your destiny and then letting everything else fall where it is and don't worry about anything else. And having that self-assurance that what you do could well be good enough, and obviously in his case it was by plenty, that's a, that's a very lethal weapon in my opinion. Being able to step back, and he does this because of his faith, but to step back and say, I, I'm not in control of the situation, I can only control what I can do, I'm going to do my best to do that and let everything else work itself out, do it one shot at a time, the past is the past, everything else is everything else, let's see where we are after we add up all the strokes. And the other thing that he really seems to do very well is get game for difficult situations, difficult courses, difficult spots, pressure-packed situations. He seems to love them and thrive on them, where it seems like other people wilt or get concerned or get nervous or anxious or, or make bad choices. Scotty Scheffler do that, and that is something it's hard to teach and it's hard to learn. You almost have to learn through failure how to learn how to make better decisions on the golf course and then to execute with your game plan against those decisions and have the faith that that's all going to work out. That's that's a big thing. Uh, the, the belief that you can win is something that gets talked about a lot in another sport I love. You have the belief, bottle, to think that you can do it. Very important. in an Self-belief is incredibly important, just as much as skill, in my opinion. You, you can have all the skill in the world, but if you don't think you're going to do it, then you won't. And Scheffler has the opposite. He believes he can do it. And he's demonstrated himself. And now that he's won six times, and again, no duds in any of the events that he's won, he's compounded that self-belief that he has developed through faith and now has that reassurance that, yes, this is the way. This is how I can do this. This is how I can be the best in the world. Got me. And I think the thing that, only thing that can trip him up from here is some stuff that's out of his control, right? Like injury, catastrophic events, those types of things. But I don't think his mindset's going to change. The only temptation I think he has to resist at this point is to get away from that attitude that he has now where he kind of believes that it's out of his hands and that everything else will work itself out if he does his part. If you start to think that you can engineer a golf tournament, that you can maybe do a, you can do a little too much more than you actually can, I think that's when players start to chase and dig deep and go in wrong directions and make bad choices, lazy, or they get overextended or, or whatever that is. But that is Scotty Scheffler, and it's been really cool to see him develop so quickly from 70 starts, wondering in 2021 whether this guy was the right guy to pick to add to the Ryder Cup team, to now wondering what in the world any of us were thinking about having Patrick Reed on the 2021 Ryder Cup team uh, by comparison is like, otherwise be on there. What it what two years makes. I'm not saying Patrick Reed's a bad player, but Scotty Scheffler has taken his game to a whole way better than I think anything people would have predicted two years ago when we were starting to think about Ryder Cup teams. He's clearly the best player on the planet right now. I I, I know that there are people who are going to say Rom is uh, better or equal, and I, and I think that's a fair thing to say. He has flamed out a little bit. He was ill. The players withdrew. So we don't have a really good mile post here comparing him to Scheffler. And, and I think McElroy's taken a little bit of a step back. And, and he has alluded to some of that at the players in part because of all of his work with the PGA Tour, trying to build a schedule, trying to build a framework for next year. That's pretty much done now, except some tweaks and some edits. So his time commitment to that will be lessened, which means he'll have more opportunity to focus on just being a player. He also kind of complained about his equipment some particularly his driver from Taylor May. He made a switch to the two at Riviera. He did that because he thought his existing driver that he loved last year would fail the characteristic time test from the PGA Tour. Basically, as a measure of how long the ball stays on your face when you hit it. And he thought that might be illegal, made a change, and kind of rushed that, I think. Didn't get it dialed in exactly where he needs to be. Now he's searching for answers there. But now he's got a little bit more time on his hands to figure that out. He can play the WGC match play, hopefully have a driver in hand he feels good about, and get ready for the Masters. And we're building to a tremendous, tremendous crescendo here. These four uh, designated tournaments in the last five weeks have been huge. Uh, I think it's been really good for golf to have them. Obviously, we've had star power win all of them. I know Kirk Kitayama won for the first time, kind of made himself a bit of a star. And that was really the only outlier in terms of winners of those designated tournaments where you went, it's, uh, that's kind of surprising. We, I mean, we've had studs win pretty much every designated event except API, and that was still a really good finish. So 
that's been good momentum for the PGA Tour. They built this thing up. Now they've got to kind of execute on the back end of the, the framework for the schedule for next year. We've talked about that some. We'll get the final details on that probably in the coming weeks. I'm guessing they'll wait till after the Masters until they start going into that a little bit more. But it, it seems like the forward progress is working really well for the PGA Tour right now. That all said, Liv has an event this week in Tucson, Arizona, a place called the Gallery Golf Club. It hosted the WGC match play in 2007-2008. Tiger won in one year. Henrik Stenson won the other. Uh, it is a golf course that has the longest par 5 in North America. I, I don't know if they'll play it to that full length for Liv, but that, that's probably a selling point. They copycatted the 16th hole as best they could, trying to come up with their own party par 3. We'll see what happens there. But you, I kind of get the sense after this, this run of designated tournaments that Liv is a little bit behind the eight ball here. They're going to have to do some things that are spectacular to get people to watch because you're not signing new players right now. So you're going to have to have a kind of run almost like a Cam Smith, Dustin Johnson showdown for four, 13 more events, something like that, to, to really build on this. Because right now the best stars in golf on the PGA Tour are performing. And, and I think the only way you're going to get that momentum that it felt that inevitability that felt like there was last year. I, don't, I think that's gone. They're, these products are just competing for themselves, but you're going to need your star players to show up every single tournament and compete. And you're going to have a marker at the majors and say, okay, yeah, you may not, you may not like our product, but we're doing well in the major championships. And that that's really coming up here less than a month from now where we get to, to see all of that stuff come together, come to a head. And I'm, I'm re very Really, really excited for this time of year, and I hope you are as well. We're building up to something really cool. Now, the second story for today is it could be a huge deal. It, it probably will be a big deal, maybe not right away, but I think it will be transformational to golf in the next three to five years. So the USGA sent out an email and jointly with the RNA to news media alerting them to a virtual digital news conference, whatever you want to call it, tomorrow morning, Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, and it'll be a joint news conference between the two governing bodies. So Martin Slumbers, who's the chief executive of the RNA, is going to be there. Mike Wan, who is the chief executive of the USGA, is going to be there, and they're going to be talking about what they're calling governance issues. And that's basically a fancy way of saying they're going to start talking about rolling back the golf, is, is what it sounds. I mean, for the reporting I've done, the people I've talked to, that's what it sounds like this is going to be an announcement of, a framework to ultimately roll back the golf ball and how far it flies, the maximum it can fly, and a time frame proposal for implementation. Now, James Corbin, Telegraph, who's been over all kinds of stories and does a great job, says that the soonest this could be 2026, and I think that's fair to say somewhere in that range. So the the, the governors are going to come out tomorrow and they're going to tell us what they want to do. Now, they have been studying this for years, and we've been talking about on this show, on other shows, on any platform I've been on for 20 years about how the golf ball probably needs to be rolled back because of the realities of distance and what that means for slow play. And we saw that at the players. I mean, you had holes where every par 5 is reachable. You have a par 4 in the 12th that was reachable. And you had players just sitting on the golf course waiting and waiting. You knew Thursday morning that the first round wasn't going to finish on Thursday. And you knew Friday morning the cut wasn't going to be made until Saturday because you just couldn't do it with the amount of daylight that you have. Part of that has to do with distance. Not because the courses are too long, but because the ball flies so far, there's so many scoring opportunities that it just creates a natural backlog in a field of 144, 156 players. It blows up the game. It, it makes it a tough product to watch. But the long-held theory has been, well, distance, the distance travels can render so many different courses obsolete, forces changes to great courses, maybe render some ineligible to host majors. Augusta National finally gave in and lengthened the 13th hole, the par 5 13th in response to distance because they want to make it more of a difficult hole to get one and two versus a driver, short iron, driver, mid iron. They want it to be a, a true risk rewards. So they moved back 50 yards. Well, the USGA and the RNA can come out and say, well, we are going to limit the max energy transfer that golf club to a golf ball, thereby limiting the distance at which it can travel. And maybe they put parameters around spin off the driver, spin off the tee, spin off different clubs. They could do all of those things. And we don't know what all of that's going to be. It sounds like there's going to be a framework in place. They're going to present that. 
and then in their typical fashion, as large administrative bodies do, they're going to get together and then say, okay, now here's a comment period. So we're going to go put out this proposal. We're going to let anybody who wants to comment, comment. And that is primarily meant for the original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs, the people who make equipment. So you're talking about your Titleists, you're talking about your TaylorMades, your Callaways, all the people that make golf balls. They're going to be able to weigh in and offer some comment. Now, does that really mean anything? No, I mean, they'll offer some constructive criticism, I'm sure. But by and large, they probably don't want this to happen, right? If you limit how far the golf is, then you render every golf ball you've made illegal. And that means all the golf balls that they make right now would not be conforming, or at least the overwhelming portion of them would not be conforming, depending on what the changes are. And if that's the case, then you have to reformulate balls, you have to change how golf balls work. That's a total upheaval of their business. And that could lead to a variety of different things. That could lead to, from the USGA and the RNA to say, okay, well, we will stagger the implementation of this. So we will only have professionals and elite competitive golfers have these rollbacks until 2030. Let's say from 2026 to 2030. Then in 2030, amateur golfers and everybody else that plays golf will have to use these balls. So you have two sets of balls you have available to you, technically speaking, for five years, something like that. And then everybody will have to use the same ball starting in 2030. And they could go that path. And then they have to figure out how much they're going to roll it back. And I'm sure they've come to this number. Is it, let's say, 10%? Are you knocking 10% of distance off? Are you knocking 20% of distance off? What does that number look like? And does that only include distance? Is it only energy transfer? Is it spin? What is it that they're trying to do? We don't know all the answers to that. But... They've been studying this for a long time, and this has been a subject for a long time. I'm sure they have formulated some opinions. I'm sure they have some ideas. And this is not just going to be, hey, a vague notion, notice that we are rolling this stuff back. Be ready. I think they're ready to, to throw it down, put a, put a line in the sand, and say, this is where it stops. This is when it starts. If you want to come at us with lawsuits and other issues, we're ready to talk about it for a while. But years from, let's say, today... To figure this thing out go and I, I for one am very interested obviously uh, I've been someone who's talked about a desire to roll back the golf ball for almost 20 years I mean truly almost 20 years I've been talking about this in different platforms avenues whatever and my mind has changed a little bit over the years on the subject matter because of the the emergence of better equipment that's not the golf ball better driver heads better shafts Obviously, TrackMan has been transformative because you can dial in how you play golf. You can dial in spin characteristics. You can dial in distance. We obviously have better and fitness regimens than there ever had been 20 years ago, even if you were the most up-to-date trained golfer on the, in the planet. You still wouldn't be as efficient as you can be now. The more we know about our bodies, the more that we know what the human body can do. We know more about the biomechanics of the golf swing, how to optimize for distance, all those types of things. We know because of data, the distance is king. There were still players 20 years ago that thought, oh, well, I'll play a more controlled game, and that will be beneficial to me in the long haul. Data's proven that's not worthwhile. You need to be a long player to have a really good chance to be the best you can be. That's why players chase distance. It's why Jordan Spieth lost two or three years of his career chasing distance. It's why Matt Fitzpatrick got 15 yards longer. We know those things. None of that stuff you can put, none of that toothpaste you can put back in the tube. And none of that is going to change regardless of what happens to the distance argument. So you're still going to have players optimize. You're still going to have great equipment within the parameters that we've already seen set by the governing bodies. You're still going to have statistical data and biomechanic information and all the stuff that we know now that you can't put back in the tube. So what can you do in terms of a rollback that is, on one hand, meaningful, but on the other hand, not so oppressive because you're trying to cover up or make good for all but all the other stuff that you can't control because it's legal and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just knowledge-based stuff. I'm very interested to see all of this, this discussion. Uh, this is kind of must-watch, must-see stuff tomorrow. I will be there very much interested in it. We will talk about it on this show, of course. But I get the sense that there is some legitimate surprise out there from the folks I've talked to in the equipment world that 
the USGA and the, and the RNA are finally going to do this. Again, this has been a topic for two decades, for 20 years. And there's been threats of lawsuits, there's been threats of action from the governing bodies. And, and finally, frankly, it, it all came together from Mike Davis saying, look, we're going to do this. We're going back the golf ball. And it took him years and leaving the USGA for this to potentially happen. And, and credit to Mike Wan and to Martin Slumbers who followed through with this. And it seems like they've arrived at the same conclusion that this needs to be done for the health of the game. A, a time frame to implement it will all be figured out over due course. This is not going to be a quick process. And, and I don't even know if you and I as regular recreational golfers are going to see a whole lot of difference in golf until next decade. That, that could very well be a possibility. So this is something that seems to be very much focused at the top of the game, but they could surprise everybody and say they're just going to start rolling everything back in 2026 and make it across the board, which is the other kind of palace intrigue here. Will we have formal bifurcation of the rules of golf, particularly around equipment standards? where professionals will play certain types of equipment moving forward and, and amateurs will not? Or are we going to do this for everybody and put everyone on the pain train and roll everyone back a while? I'm, I have no idea what's going to happen. I think that's what has me excited. It's, a, again, not going to be a one-day rubber stamp, this is what we're doing process. There's going to be some twists and turns along the way, and I would imagine there's probably some legal briefs being drawn up as we speak. And... That there could be a, a lot at work here, but the USGA and the RNA have an enormous war chest because of their media rights fees that they generate for their championships. They can defend themselves, and I think that the governing bodies know that they now is probably their one and only opportunity to do, to do this before maybe it gets too late, too entrenched, even though it's been two decades since the Pro V1 was introduced. So, very exciting times on the equipment front. We will find out more tomorrow. We have the Valspar Championship this week. We have the Hope Classic on the Champions Tour. We've got the SEC Championship co-sanctioned between the DP World Tour and the Sunshine Tour. We've got Live Golf this week. We, we've got a pretty busy week coming up inside the ropes, and this just adds to the intrigue of all that. So that's going to do it for us today on 2 Out the First. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the show. I've been Ryan Ballingy. If you want to follow us on a podcast service and give us a five-star review, very much appreciated. If you're watching on YouTube, Please consider subscribing and smashing that like button. It helps us reach more people. We'll be back with another show tomorrow. Until then, have a great evening. Talk to you next time on 2 of the 1st.